Kieran Gillen and Asad Ribbit continue to bring the Eternals back into the spotlight as a murder mystery grips the heroes, who gather not only to determine how Thanos is alive, but also save the world from being rendered uninhabitable. Kieran Gillen continues to build an epic, grand in scale storyline here by again filtering in a few more Eternals into the story, this time being Cersei and Kingo as the hero's mission for what I can assume will be the first arc is detailed. It's pretty standard stuff actually, with the Eternals tasked with saving Earth from being destroyed, but I love the murder mystery angle that's in play as well, and having these real godlike beings solving something so mundane as a murder is quite interesting, especially with an extra layer of paranoia being added as one of them could actually be the killer, or at least responsible for bringing Thanos into the world again. I really enjoyed Machine also narrating the whole issue and series by the looks of it, thanks to its newer sentient state where it becomes ironically a little more human. The way it's written is the perfect analogue for the audience, since thanks to the sort of reboot it's gone through it never knows more than we do, and it's a great way to have the Machine reiterate things about the Eternals that newer readers might might not know of, and things long-time readers might need a reminder of. Asad Ribic again paints some really stellar pages, especially the action side of things near the start of the book. His early pages with Thanos fighting Icarus perfectly captured the epic nature of superpowered god beings battling unkillable titans. There was a brutality to it and viciousness to it, and it was wonderful to see it play out in bloody and savage fashion. Eternals issue 2 was another fantastic issue that forwarded the story in a great new direction, opening up an interesting murder mystery for the heroes to solve. The action was all top notch, and with more Eternals returning each issue, I cannot wait till the big confrontation against Thanos, probably in a couple more issues. I'm going to give this issue a 10 out of 10. Eternals issue 2 finds Icarus and Sprite face off against Thanos in the ruins of Titanos. Icarus is happy for the battle, blasting the villain with his heat vision, saying he's never fought Thanos before. Thanos is glad to find another poet of annihilation, wanting to trade verse with him as he slams the hero into the ground. Icarus calls for Sprite, telling her to return to Olympia and warn the others while he deals with the mad titan. Icarus soon spots the time portal, grabbing the villain and diving through it with him. The temporal flux of the portal causes them to fall through time, continuing to viciously claw at one another until they land back where they begun their battle. Icarus knows that it was a good fight, but would have been better had he won it. Thanos' wounds begin to close as Death herself rejects him, but luckily Icarus is eternal as the villain rips the hero's head clean off. Icarus' body however disappears as the real Icarus knows had Thanos not been having him as much fun as he was, he would have realised that he was fighting one of Sprite's holograms. Icarus tells Sprite to let him go since he wants to end this now, but the girl tells him that he's hurt, so they will call this fight a draw for now. Icarus knows that had he died he would have returned soon enough, and wants to bathe his fist in Thanos' blood. Sprite says that it's in his nature to get into fights, and it's her nature to get them out of it, and besides, no one would believe her if she told him that Thanos is there. The machine notes how Icarus and Sprite leave the area knowing who the murderer is, and that a small boy is in danger, and it's not the first time Icarus gained knowledge from a rip in space and time. Machine remembers Icarus going to the Bronze Age, where he saw a coastline and a boy and a deviant. Icarus asks the Machine to find where that coastline is, and if he survives, he would deal with it. Machine finds the coastline and the boy, so Icarus goes to see him. The boy asks if the man is a god, but Icarus says he'll give no answer, since a god would deny being a god, and if he answers that he is a god, then he would be worshipped, which he doesn't want. He asks about the monster, and the boy points him in its direction, as he shows the hero a dead squirrel squid, which Icarus points out isn't a monster. The boy thinks it is, being it's grotesque, but Icarus knows that there was actually a monster there, having seen it in his vision. The boy thinks that he'll wait to see if it comes, but the hero has other duties, hoping the boy will assist him and build a pyre so the machine can watch over them until the monster comes and he will return to fight it. The boy agrees and builds a fire, sitting by it for weeks and years until eventually he grows old and the machine in him ceases to function, leading to the man dying 
dying and having never seen the monster. The man's family lit the man on fire in the funeral pyre and Icarus soon returns. The boy's grandson yells at the god, saying the man wasted his life, watching and waiting for a monster that never came. Icarus says that he watched for monsters as well, apologizing for their loss. The beings say that their father and grandfather wasted their life until suddenly the monster appears. Hours pass and Icarus soon wins the battle against the Deviant and the village ate bountifully. And for a thousand years they lit bonfires in times of need and despite the god not always coming, they felt better since the bonfire kept them warm. Machine hopes that Icarus's current adventure has a happy ending like that as on Olympus, the Yellow Eternals don't believe Thanos is back, asking for proof. Icarus points to his swollen face as proof and they will match it with Zoras's. Sprite tells them to stop arguing since Thanos is there so they need to do something about it. Druig says that they need to wait for Zoras to be brought back since he'll be able to decide, but Icarus wants to go for Thanos now before he escapes. Druig knows that Thanos won't be going anywhere while they still live, something Icarus realizes is true so they'll spread the word and prepare hunting parties for when Zoras returns. Fastos however says he won't be returning since there has been no communication from the Wardens of the exclusion and upon investigating, he found them killed and their resurrection machines all destroyed. So the dead will now stay dead forever. The machine realizes this is why he feels broken, trying to maintain a level of professionalism one would expect from a planet of his status. Sprite wonders what they will do now and Droog knows that they need to listen to the system and move to the select a new Prime Eternal. Again, Icarus argues with his fellow Eternals, thinking Droog has allied with Thanos, but the man tells him that he barely has a chance to win the vote, and Icarus is the one who will be most likely selected to be Prime Eternal now. Droog soon realizes that Icarus has been alone with Sprite this entire time, and he was the last to go to the exclusion, so he has the opportunity to destroy all of the machines. Icarus threatens him with violence as Cersei arrives, telling Icarus to calm himself and not make it too easy for Droog, since he won't be able to help anyone if he's locked up. She tells Droog to stop with the accusations, since with Thanos about, it's not the time for that. Cersei wants to help heal Icarus's wounds as Droog tells him to leave and start their scheming. Heading out of the chambers, Icarus is healed by Cersei's touch as Sprite again asks what are they going to do, thinking they need to warn the humans. Cersei knows the Avengers would like to know about Thanos being on their planet, but there are complications since disruption of the part of the machine would mean disruption of all, and if they cannot get it reactivated, then the world will be destroyed within a week. Fastos shows the planet would be rendered uninhabitable for humans as the ecosystems would be killed off one by one. The being compares it to the movie Geostorm, but Kingo hopes that it will be better than that, telling his friends he almost got a role in that movie. Cersei hopes that she doesn't regret bringing them in on this conspiracy as Kingo asks what conspiracy they are hiding, so Fastos says the world ending is one problem, and one all Eternals will act upon, meaning they might miss the smaller one since Thanos is not of the Great Machine. The being asks the Great Machine who gave Thanos an exception and if it can be removed, but the machine finds no data of any such exception. Machine knows that it wants to say sorry, but that would reveal to the Eternals something is amiss with it, so it stays quiet. Sprite knows that they have a traitor amidst their ranks, feeling all eyes are now on her. Cersei knows that they need to root this traitor out, and Sprite is glad Cersei trusts her, but Icarus says that Cersei doesn't trust Sprite, and is only keeping her around so she's not out of her sight. Cersei confirms as much, since Sprite is either a true innocent or the culprit, and either way, she needs to be kept close and besides, she's adorable now. Icarus takes his leave, since he has one thing he has to deal with and needs his immediate attention. He says he'll be there when something needs its nose broken, as Sprite asks what he's going to do. In the rainy New York suburbs, Icarus meets with Toby Robson, who sheepishly confirms his identity to the hero. Icarus introduces himself, saying he's there to protect the boy and will give his life for his. Toby thinks that's neat, wondering if he can close his window now since he's really getting wet from the rain. The machine knows the boy thinks that he's still dreaming, but a more accurate word begins with the letter N and it involves more screaming.